Hi everyone, let's start with the concept capsules for today. The topic that we're going to look at is bond valuation. Now bond valuation itself is not too tough. What we're going to actually focus upon is the importance of the difference between coupon and yield and how they're related to each other and how that affects the pricing dynamics. Now the first thing that we're going to look at is the difference between the value and the price. Because a lot of times we would come across a uh, text which would say that you need to price a bond. What we are in fact doing is that we are valuing a bond. When we say price, technically that refers to a market price. Now market price is something which is dependent upon the consensus market opinions, what most people think in the market. So it's a function of the demand and supply. Now the price remains the same for everyone across the market at one particular point of time for most of the assets. So price is not going to change from person to person. So let's say if it's a stock, you'll be able to see the price in the stock market. If it's a bond, then we would be able to look at the price in the bond exchange. So that price is the same for everyone. When we talk about valuation, valuation, not just for bond, for, but for you know any asset is a fairly subjective process because we have to apply a lot of assumptions and these assumptions are going to change from person to person. So for instance, one analyst might say that a stock or a bond is overvalued. Another might say that the same bond is undervalued and another might feel that it's fairly valued. Not, we are not saying that one is wrong or the other is right. What we're saying is that they're coming to different values because they are using different assumptions in the analysis. And for any market to exist, you need to have different opinions in the market. So value essentially means that how much do you think a particular asset is worth? Now, this is going to, as we just said, it's going to change from person to person. It's going to differ from person to person based on the assumptions. So whenever we are calculating, whenever we are valuing something, keep in mind that the process is better known as valuation rather than pricing. All right. So the price is determined by the consensus opinion of the market. That's what we saw. Now, pretty much everything in finance is valued using DCF, using time value of money. So we get back to our old friend, the timeline. So this is what the timeline is. So from zero right till infinity. So just a quick recap, we have various future values, FP1, FP2, and FP3. If we have to price any asset, what do we do? We discount every future value to time period zero. So that means we're calculating the present value at time period zero. So FP1 gets discounted for one year, the future value two gets discounted for two years. Similarly, future value three gets discounted for three years. And to calculate the asset's current value or uh, you know uh, the way we uh, uh, value any stock or a bond, for instance, we would simply add up all of these present values. That would be the current value of the asset. We're going to apply exactly the same principle to bond valuation as well. Now for bond valuation, what do we do? For bond valuation, we take the regular cash flows that we're getting and we discount it to today. But keep in mind, right at the end, we have to add the par value as well, because it's the loan which a company or an issuer has taken from you. They still need to return the par value back. So C1, C2, and C3 refers to the coupon payments, which are there in the first three years. Right at the end, so this is a three-year maturity bond. Right at the end, you're going to get the par value back as well. All of these coupons are discounted to time period zero at Y, which is the yield. Typically, we could take yield to maturity or any of the other yield measures. Now, the most common point of confusion which happens in the analysis is that people tend to confuse the C and Y. And that if you end up doing that, then you would not really be able to value the bond. So first, let's understand what the difference between C and Y is. Now, avoiding all the jargons, we'll just Think about an intuitive way to understand the difference between C and Y. C is the coupon. Now you can, uh, even the text or even the general terminology would call it coupon interest, but we're going to avoid the term coupon interest. We're just going to call it the coupon because we're going to reserve the term interest for the denominator, which is yield. So let's not call it coupon interest as far as fixed income is concerned. For the purpose of simplicity, we'll simply call it coupon. Now coupon is what the issuer is ready to give you. So that is the rate of return, which the issuer is ready to provide to you on a regular basis. So that's what the coupon is. Now, what is the yield or the interest? 
which goes into the denominator. That is essentially your discounting rate. Like any other discounting rate, this is your required rate of return. So for the level of risk that you're taking by investing your money into that particular bond, what is the return, the minimum return which you expect? So that is why. So the minimum rate that we require given the risky, uh, the risky nature of the bond. Now, the price of the bond would really be determined by, uh, you know, the relationship between C and Y. Now, what is the relationship? Now, to take a, a, a simple example, let's say the coupon is 12% and yield is 8%. Now, that means that for the level of risk of a particular bond, my minimum rate of return was 8%, but the issuer, the company is actually ready to give me 12%, which means I would love to actually get this bond. But this would be the case for the other participants in the market as well, which means that this bond is not going to trade at the par value, which is supposed like 100. It's going to trade at higher than that because it is giving more return than what you require. So if the coupon is more than the yield, which is the case here, then the bond will trade at a premium, which means the price will be 100 plus some value because it is giving you a higher rate of return than what you demanded. So if C is more than Y, the bond is going to trade at a premium. Let's say if the coupon instead of being 12 was, let's say 6%. That means now your coupon is less than the yield. So the minimum rate of return that you required was eight, but the issuer is not compensating you sufficiently for the level of risk which you are taking. So they're only ready to give you 6%. So in this case, to make up for the lost return, what will you do? You're not going to pay $100 for this bond anymore. You'll ask for a discount on that bond. So let's say $20, uh, let's say $90 or $95 or some other value like that. Okay. So that means the bond will trade at a discount. So when your coupon is less than your yield, the bond is going to trade at a discount. If both the values are equal, which means the issuer's rate of return is equal to the, your rate of the, uh, you know, the rate of return which you demanded, then there's no reason for the bond to trade at more than 100 or less than 100. It will trade at exactly 100, which means it's going to trade at par. Now, the next concept that we're looking at is the source of return and the types of bond. Now, this is quite an important thing because it helps you develop intuition for the various different kind of bonds which are there. So I would strongly recommend that you should remember the three sources of return. It helps you with your analysis everywhere. And it's quite simple. Now, what are the various sources of return from a bond? First is obviously the coupon income. That is the regular rate of return which you're getting. So that's the first one. Second is reinvestment. What do we mean by reinvestment? Every coupon that you're getting, what do you do with that coupon? you're going to reinvest it at the market rate of return. So that coupon is not just lying idle, it is also earning additional rate of return on that. So that is your re reinvestment income. The third source of return is capital gain. Capital gain means P1 minus P0, which means ending price minus your acquisition or your opening price. So let's say if you purchased a bond at 90 and now uh, you're able to sell it at 100, then that $10 is your capital gain. Now, why are we really looking at all of these sources of return? The main part which you need to remember is that if you compromise on one of the sources of returns, so let's say if the coupon was to be lesser than the peers, uh, lesser than the other bonds, then the, you know, uh, the total return has to be made up by increasing the other components. Now, how does that work? Let's see in the next topic. Now, let's look at some examples of bonds. So if we have a plain vanilla bond, what is a plain vanilla bond? Plain vanilla instrument means that it does not have any bells and whistles attached. It's the simplest form of that security. So plain vanilla bond would mean that let's say you have a five-year bond, which is paying you an annual coupon. And uh, right at the end, you get your par value or your principal back. So that would be a plain vanilla bond. So it's fixed rate bond. There is no floating rate. It's not callable, puttable, etc. So plain vanilla bond, how to value this? We just saw. You take all the various coupons right at the end. You have the power value as well, and then you discount all the cash flows and add them up together. So that's easy. Now, let's see what would you do if you had a zero coupon bond? What does a zero coupon bond mean? Zero coupon bond means that you're not getting any regular income. Now, let's put this into the previous analysis, the sources of return. 
If the bond is not giving you any coupon, that means that you've completely compromised this source of return. You're not getting any coupon at all. That also means that there is no reinvestment income. If you're not getting any coupon, then what are you going to reinvest? So even this source goes away. That means that the only source left is capital gain. Now, how will capital gain work? Now keep in mind, it's a bond, it's not a stock, which means the par value is fixed. So if the par value is $1,000, in that case, the only way that you can make money from a zero coupon bond is if you were to purchase it at a discount at anything less than $1,000. So if you purchase it at anything less than $1,000, that is the return over the period. So if you're compromising on the coupon and reinvestment, you make up for that loss using the capital gain component. Okay. Similarly, we have a deferred coupon bond. So what does a deferred coupon bond mean? Deferred coupon means that, let's say if it's a 10 year bond, the bond is not going to give you any coupon for the first three or four years. Probably because let's say, uh, it's a, let's say it's an infrastructure project. It's not going to generate the cash flows immediately. It will take three to four years for that project to get built. So that's why the company or the issuer cannot afford to pay you the coupon. Once the project is ready, then they start paying you a coupon, which could be typically higher than the market rate, which is there. So that's a deferred coupon bond. Now let's look at a couple of examples to understand bond valuation. Now Jennings purchased bond A with a coupon payment per period of 4% for four years at a price of 106. The bond yield is most likely less than four, more than four or equal to four. Now let's see, the price is 106. Typically your future value would be 100. So your par value would have been 100, which means that this bond is trading at a premium. Now, when does a bond trade at a premium? The bond trades at a premium when it's giving you a higher return than what you require, which means that the coupon should be more than Y. Now, how much is the coupon? That's 4%, which means this will be greater than Y. Or the, just stated the other way, the yield should be less than 4%. So the correct answer in this case is A. The yield will most likely be less than 4% and that's the reason why the bond is trading at a premium. So that's your correct answer. And let's look at another question. The present value of a newly issued 10 year $1,000 par value security that will pay every six months. So remember, this is a very important part every six months. It's not an annual paid bond. It's paying you every six months. It's a semi annual paid bond with an annual YTM of 8%. So we need to calculate what the value would be. So we need to calculate the present value. Now let's see what are the various numbers which you need to put in into your BA2 plus calculator. It's a 10 year bond. Now 10 year, if it was paying on an annual basis, then we would have taken N as 10 but this is paying every six months, which means N ends up being 10 into two, which is 20. Thousand dollars is the par value. So this is your future value. It's going to pay every six months with an annual YTM of 8%. Now 8% is per year. For, uh, for six months, what would it be? That becomes 4%. So that is 4%. That's what we're looking at. Now, based on this, we need to calculate the present value of the bond. How do we calculate? It's paying you $60 periodically. So 60 becomes your PMT. That's your coupon. 60 plus thousand, that's your future value. That's your power value, which you're going to get. So using the financial calculator, N is 20. PMT, that's the coupon which you're getting. That's 60. Future value is thousand. I by Y, which is interest or yield. That is four. All that you need to do is to compute and PV. So just put it into your BA2 plus calculator and you'll be able to get the answer as minus 1271. So that's it for the bond valuation, guys. I hope the difference between coupon and yield is now clear and you won't get confused between the two.